Today, the gift of glycine. It might be the smallest amino acid, but it definitely makes its presence known. So let's talk a little about what makes it special. What really makes it special is what it doesn't have. It doesn't really have a side chain. You can say that its side chain is a hydrogen, and typically I say like its side chain is a hydrogen. But most of the other amino acids have something cool, something big sticking out there. Some have cool functional groups, so parts that can do things like a hydroxyl group or an amine group. Glycine, it just has a hydrogen. And this makes it so that I classify it as one of the weirdos of the amino acids, but that doesn't mean that it's not important. It's the smallest of the bunch, and this actually matters a bunch when we think about how it affects the folding of proteins. You see, the size of the side chain influences how the protein can fold, because we have these different amino acids linked up and all their side chains are hanging off. And if those side chains are big and bulky, they're going to make it so that it's harder to twist up the backbone to make angles because the side chains are going to be doing what we call steric clashing. Basically, get out of my space. We can't occupy the same space. Glycine doesn't take up that much space, and so it can take on those kind of weird angles. This is going to make it so that if you were to go and look at the angles, which you could do by using a technique like X-ray crystallography to figure out the atomic structure of the molecule, so like of a protein, like how all those angles actually are arranged, you'd see that glycine was going to take on angles that are different than the other amino acids. And so sometimes in like a Ramachandran plot, which is actually showing those backbone angles, so we have what we call the psi and the phi angles, the points on the backbone at which you can actually twist. If you look at those angles for glycine, they're going to be like way different than the angles that you would see for most other amino acids because glycine is so flexible. Also, because it's so flexible, it's bad at kind of holding structures steady. When you want to have things like alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, the glycines typically aren't going to be found here because they're going to be too loosey-goosey. But you often will find glycine at, say, the turns in between these beta strands. So like these hairpin turns in these beta strands, which together make a beta sheet. Glycine is often found there. It's also found in some weird structures like a collagen triple helix where you see it team up with one of the other structural weirdos, our proline, which it kind of has the opposite pro problem where it's kind of stuck in place. Glycine and proline pair up and they make this collagen triple helix, which is pretty cool. But you're typically not going to find them in your normal alpha helices. Other than like structural limitations, you can pretty much find glycine anywhere in a protein because it's in the middle of the what we call hydropathy index. Basically, how much water wants to hang out with them or doesn't want to hang out with them. If things have properties that make water want to hang out with them, things like charge or partial charge, we call them hydrophilic, and water will readily let them join in their network. If things don't, if they're just like hydrocarbons, then water is going to exclude them push those things together, say push those parts of a protein to the center of the protein, helping the protein fold, and making it so that you want to find that amino acid very commonly on the surface. Glycine's in the middle, so you'll find it both places. Another interesting thing about glycine is that it's achiral, which means that unlike the other amino acids, which kind of have a right and a left hand that are non-superimposable mirror images of one another, glycine, it's just has one. So it's universal. You can flip it. You can flip it either way and it'll still look the same. So we call it achiral. You don't have those like L and D versions like you would for the other amino acids. Glycine can be made from serine. If you look at glycine, you see it has two carbons. We don't really have many two carbon compounds in biochemistry if you look at like our metabolism charts. Instead, what we do to make glycine is we chop a carbon off of something that has three carbons. And so we take this carbon off of serine, and this is going to give us glycine. Well, we take the carbon and the alcohol group. We release the alcohol group as water, and we put the carbon onto tetrahydrofolate to give us 510-methylene tetrahydrofolate. If you've ever heard of like folic acid supplements and things like this, well, folic acid is an important cofactor or folate. So folic acid, folate, same thing. It's just whether or not it's protonated. There are various kind of forms of folic acid, and they're great for moving carbons. 
from one place to another. And so, so a vitamin B6 using enzyme is going to take the carbon off of serine, give you glycine, and put that carbon onto THF to give you 510-methylene THF, which can then be used to make nucleic acids. It can be used to do all sorts of other things. And so vitamin B metabolism is interrelated with folate metabolism, which is interrelated with glycine metabolism. And so lots of cool stuff with that that we're not going to go into right now. But know that glycine is involved in this kind of indirect way. The carbons from glycine itself can also be used. They can be used to make purines. So the rings, of the A and G rings of your nucleic acids, so these nitrogenous bases, these nucleobases, we have the adenine and the guanine are our purines, and glycine serves as a source of some of the carbons for them. Glycine also serves as a source of some of the carbons and nitrogens for porphyrins. So things like your heme, which holds on to oxygen and hemoglobin and allows hemoglobin to therefore transport oxygen through your bloodstream. Some of the carbons and nitrogen, so this kind of like inner part of the ring that are holding on to the iron, that are holding on to the oxygen, those are coming from glycine. Also coming from glycine is part of glutathione. So if you think about taking a glycine, a cysteine, and a glutamate and kind of sticking them together awkwardly, you get this molecule glutathione. And glutathione is an important antioxidant. It can be used to either kind of prevent oxidative damage before it happens or correct it once it does happen. And so one of the types of oxidative damage that can happen is that cysteine, so another amino acid that we'll meet later, is actually able to form these crosslinks, these covalent linkages between different amino acids in protein. Sometimes this is something you want, sometimes it's something you don't want. It can form between different proteins within the same protein, all these various things. If they happen in a controlled manner, great. If they happen in an uncontrolled manner, not so great. We can refer to antioxidants as reducing agents. They can reduce these crosslinks. And then this is going to allow those proteins to kind of function normally again. One of the properties that glycine shares with other amino acids is that we typically see it in its zwitterionic form. We talk about a zwitterion, but that means it has fully positive and fully negative parts, but it's neutral overall. And what it can do is that the amino group can actually act as a acid and give off a proton. And the carboxylate group can actually act as a base and take a proton. And so I know it sounds a little weird because we have carboxylic acid, but what you're looking at here is carboxylic acid form. Here you're looking at the carboxylate form. And in the carboxylate form, that's the conjugate base of the conjugate acid. So it can act as a base, take a proton and become the conjugate acid. Similarly, our amine group in the protonated form, where we typically find it, is going to be able to act as an acid, give up a proton, and then it's going to become its basic form. But in order to do that, you have to get to a high pH. And in order to protonate the carboxylate group, you need to get to a low pH, which is why we typically find it in the Zwitter ionic form. However, that Zwitter ionic form can act as both an acid in the form of the amino group and a base in the form of the carboxylate group. Therefore, we can say it's amphoteric and amphiprotic, and we can use it as a buffer. And so it can be used to help stabilize pH. It's good for holding a pH study at about 6, which is not ideal for a lot of things in the lab. But one of the things that it can be useful for is if you're doing a trisglycine page, which is a type of electrophoresis, where glycine is going to partner up with another buffer, tris, and they make a nice buffer, a nice pH stabilizer that's going to allow you to use it in your gel mesh that is going to separate proteins by size. And so trisglycine gels are a common type of gel that you might come across in the lab. And if you want to do something in the lab with the pH around 6, glycine could be a good choice. Glycine is used as a buffer, not just in the lab, but also in toiletries and cosmetics. So about 15,000 tons of it are made commercially each year. In addition to all of it that's being made in your body by transferring the carbon from serine onto tetrahydrofolate to give you 510-methylene tetrahydrofolate and glycine. NASA has also found it in samples taken from comets, so it's not just us that find the glycine cool. Maybe some aliens do as well.
or at least there's evidence of it on comets, even if there's not evidence of life on those comets. A little bit of its history. So I did a lot of a deep dive into the history of some of the amino acids when I was first making these posts in undergrad. So glycine, it was the first amino acid to be isolated from a protein through acid hydrolysis. So basically where you use acid to break up a protein and then kind of analyze the parts. So I say it, it was the first, but depending on where you look, it's sometimes listed the second after leucine, but we'll go with first for now. It was discovered by Henry Brackenot in 1820. It's a pretty interesting story because he wasn't actually looking to find out what proteins were made of. He just knew that if he treated plant products like wood or straw with acid, then you'd make sugar. And he was like, okay, well, what about animal products? If I treat animal products with acid, will I get sugar? And so he took gelatin and he boiled it with sulfuric acid for five hours, added some calcium carbonate to neutralize the acid, filtered it, and left it for a month. Yeah, no, he wasn't being lazy. He just wanted to see if it would crystallize. And it did crystallize. And so he got these crystals growing on the walls of his glass. And he's like, let's taste these. Bad idea. In general, you don't want to taste anything that is happening in the lab. Even if the thing itself isn't toxic, like who knows where that glassware has been, man. But anyway, he went and ate it, or at least tasted it. And he's like, taste sweet. Ha ha, I found glucose. So he's like, okay, well, logical name. It's a sugar that comes from gelatin. Let's name it sucre de gelatin, which I probably pronounced wrong, and but was translated into German as Limezucker, which I probably also pronounced wrong. So apologies. Anyway, he went and he did some characterization. He did some basic stuff like, is it soluble? How soluble? But he didn't do much more. He didn't even discover that it contained nitrogen. I know this is not being judgmental. He did a lot, a lot more than I can say for myself. But yeah, he didn't do too much more. Other scientists, however, did. And one of the scientists who was working on the problem was Evan Norton Horsford. And he's like, okay, this is not a sugar dude. So we should not name it like it's a sugar. He suggested the name Glycocol for sweet glue in 1846. Because remember, this was coming from gelatin originally. And then two years later, another scientist, Berzelius, like, no, that does not sound pretty. And, well, it doesn't really jibe with all these other amino acids that we've now named, which have these sort of, like, E names. So he suggested the shorter name that finally stuck, glycine. And that's how we know it now. Huge thanks to Jalishka, Sandwich Kind on Twitter, or what used to be Twitter, and Dr. Anita Corbett, who answered my call for translation help getting the German translated into English. And so this is where it stands and kind of some of the highlights of early protein chemistry. And that's your glycine. So stay tuned to see what you'll see on day two.